Thanks for joining us on Arirang News. I'm Kim Dami in Seoul. South Korea over the weekend played a propaganda broadcast near the border with North Korea against the regime's repeated launches of waste-carrying balloons. The North has sent yet another round of those balloons with a warning of further new actions. <laughs> President Yoon Sagar goes on a so-called K-Silk Road journey with his first foreign trip to this year to three Central Asian countries this week. Boosting resource security and bringing people closer together are the main goals of the trip. Far-right parties performed strongly in the European Parliament vote. French President Emmanuel Macron called for snap elections after his party suffered defeat on Sunday. South Korea has resumed the broadcasting of anti-Pyongyang messages along the border in retaliation against the North's trash-carrying balloon deliveries. Now the regime snapped back, warning of new responses. Our defense correspondent Choi min reports. Tensions are reaching new heights on the Korean peninsula. Over the weekend, North Korea sent more trash-carrying balloons to the south, prompting the South Korean military to reactivate its loudspeaker campaigns along the inter-Korean border for the first time in six years. In a press briefing on Monday, the military said preparations are in place for such broadcasts whenever necessary. Our military is conducting operations flexibly in line with the strategic and operational condition. The loudspeaker campaigns were officially suspended in 2018 as part of an inter-Korean military agreement to defuse tensions along the border. The last broadcast was in 2016 as a response to the North's fourth nuclear test. It aired K-pop, news, and criticism of the regime's human rights abuses, drawing anger from the North. The South Korean military reportedly blasted similar messages for around two hours on Sunday afternoon and played songs such as BTS's Dynamite and Butter. Bruce Bennett, a junk defense researcher at Rand Corporation, says Kim Jong-un would not want elite families in the capital hearing the broadcasts. And it's important to remember that many of the soldiers in the forward area are from the elite Songbun. They're people who are from the elites out of Pyongyang, children of, of elites. So reaching them is something which the North is really not going to like, as they demonstrated in 2015. In 2015, they were willing to come to the negotiating table over it. Now they seem to want to simply escalate. And the regime is apparently not about to back down. North Korea sent additional trash-carrying balloons late Sunday after the resumption of the broadcast from the south. Around 310 balloons were detected by the military from Sunday night to Monday morning. In a statement, the sister of North Korea's leader Kim Yo-jong threatened there would be, quote, new responses if South Korea continued to engage in the sending of anti-Pyongyang leaflets and loudspeaker provocations. We could expect that they could send drones across the border. Um, they could send their own balloons across the border that are not just uh, trash, but other kinds of materials, leaflets, things like that, that they've done in the past. Uh, they could take very offensive attitudes towards President Yoon and, and his key personnel. The military's assessment of Kim's remarks was that they varied slightly from previous comments regarding the level of threats, but vowed to sufficiently respond to any new response from the North. Choi min -jang. Arirang News. President Yoon suk yeol sets off on his first foreign trip this year, heading to three Central Asian countries, with the first stop being Turkmenistan. This comes as the administration rolls out a new initiative for the region. It's called, it's so-called, K-Silk Road Initiative. Our correspondent Oh soo has more. President Yoon suk yeol will seek to secure energy and resources cooperation during his state visits to three Central Asian countries embarking on his new K-Silk Road initiative. The South Korean leader on Monday starts his first overseas trip this year with a state visit to Turkmenistan, the world's fourth largest holder of natural gas reserves. Upon arriving in Ashgabat, President Yoon will hold a summit meeting with President Serdar Berda Mohamedov, followed by an MOU signing ceremony and a joint press conference. With bilateral trade at a modest 70 million US dollars last year, Yoon's visit will focus on establishing a foundation for more business activities and cooperation on areas like transportation and infrastructure. President Yoon will engage in deep discussions with Turkmen leaders on elevating bilateral cooperation to a new level, particularly in energy and plant sectors, as well as exploring new areas of cooperation, such as shipbuilding, healthcare and education. 
You will also hold a separate meeting and luncheon with Goban Gulibadze Mohamedo, the former Turkmen president and People's Council chairman on Tuesday, before attending a business forum. The South Korean leader will then travel to Kazakhstan and head to Uzbekistan on Thursday for top-level talks and business deals. The three-nation tour comes as the UN administration launched its K-Silk Road initiative last week to engage five Central Asian countries, including Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, aiming to strengthen South Korea's resource security, expand official development assistance to the region, and increase human and cultural exchanges, along with cooperation between governments, businesses and citizens. The combined area of these five nations spans 3.55 million square kilometers, over 15 times the size of the Korean peninsula, and their population of 80 million presents a promising consumer market. Their abundant reserves of oil, gas and critical minerals make them key partners for advanced industrial collaboration with South Korea. Yoon's office says its third regional strategy to date will become a milestone in elevating Korea-Central Asia relations, expanding Seoul's diplomatic network and cooperation as it looks to become a global pivotal state. Woo Seung, Arirang News. And ahead of President Yoon's day visit to Turkmenistan, local media reported on the active high-level exchanges between the two countries and their contribution to deepening a mutually beneficial relationship. According to reports in the Turkmenistan and Russian-language neutral Turkmenistan newspapers, welcoming President Yoon on Monday, South Korea is a country with a long-standing history with Turkmenistan and a partner in areas including capital, infrastructure and technology. The reports also said South Korea is actively playing a role in contributing to the peace and prosperity of the international community under the banner of a global pivotal state. Amid doctors are planning to hold a general strike next week here in South Korea, the government has ordered them to continue medical treatment and re report if they are off duty. Our Park go has the latest. South Korea's health ministry said on Monday it has decided to order private practitioners to keep treating patients and report if they will not be on duty based on the medical laws. That's a response to the doctor's decision to conduct a general strike next week. The health ministry also said it would review whether the Korea Medical Association has been violating the Fair Trade Act by encouraging doctors to participate in collective action. Doctors affiliated to the KMA announced on Sunday that they will halt medical services on June 18 and hold a general rally with 140,000 members and medical students that day. That was decided after a vote last week, which was participated in by more than 60 percent of KMA members. When asked about whether one would participate in the walkout in June, over 70 percent voted yes, which a KMA official said was an overwhelming result. The Emergency Committee of Professors at Seoul Medical University and Seoul National University Hospital has also decided to stop outpatient services and surgery starting next Monday. Amid doctors announcing these plans for a general walkout, the government gave its stance on Sunday. These actions are not just a huge burden on the emergency care system, but they also leave a deep scar on our whole society. The government will try to persuade the medical community right to the last minute to prevent a general strike and will put all efforts into minimizing medical gaps. The government once again promised that it would not punish junior doctors who return to work. Park go -nyu, Arirang News. In the first five months of this year, exports to the U.S. surpassed those to China. Now, if that trend continues, annual exports to the U.S. could exceed those to China for the first time in 22 years. Our Choi Soo-hyung reports. From January to May this year, South Korea's total exports to the United States exceeded its exports to China. According to the Trade Ministry on Monday, if this trend continues in the second half of the year, annual shipments to the states could surpass those to China for the first time since 2002. Between January and May, South Korea's exports to the U.S. totaled 53.3 billion U.S. dollars, which is $610 million more than the $52.7 billion of exports to China. Across the whole of last year, exports to the U.S. were $115.7 billion, which was $9.1 billion less than exports to China. However, since 2016, exports to the U.S. have been steadily increasing, driven by sales of cars and batteries. 
They surpassed $100 billion for the first time in 2022 and reached a record high last year. For large companies, exports to the U.S. last year reached $79.5 billion, surpassing their exports to China for the first time in 20 years thanks to increased sales of eco-friendly cars, SUVs and machineries. Small and medium-sized companies are also like to export more to the U.S. than to China this year, driven by a surge in cosmetics and machinery exports. In contrast, exports to China have been falling since 2021. They had a record high of $162.9 billion in 2021, but due to the slowdown in Chinese manufacturing, they fell to $124.8 billion last year. However, the situation could change as the Chinese economy is slowly starting to recover. Recently, the International Credit Rating Agency, Moody's, raised its forecast for China's economic growth rates this year from 4% to 4.5%. In April, the Bank of Korea predicted that exports to the U.S. would continue to boost the Korean economy, supported by increased investment by Korean companies in the U.S. and sustained U.S. consumer demand. Cho Soo-hyung, Arirang News. Preliminary results from the European Parliament election show the centre-right European People's Party to be the winner. And French President Emmanuel Macron called for a fresh, fresh election on Sunday and dissolved Parliament. Yi seung has more. The preliminary results of the European Parliament elections show the centrists holding ground despite far-right parties taking key victories. With a total of 720 seats in the Parliament, the center-right European People's Party won 186 seats, 10 more than the previous term. However, on the far right, the Identity and Democracy Party, the political home of France's National Rally and Italy's Lega Party, gained 11 seats compared to the previous term, thanks to National Rally's lead candidate Jordan Bardella garnering 31.5 percent of the vote, roughly twice that of French President Emmanuel Macron's Renaissance Party. The crushing defeat for Macron's party led to the French president dissolving parliament and a call for a fresh election. Sunday's decision was met with disbelief by Macron's supporters, while supporters of the National Rally Party celebrated the announcement. The first round of the French parliamentary election takes place on June 30th, with the second round set for July 7th. With the 10th European Parliament elections coming to a close, the process of forming a new leadership for the EU bloc for the next five years begins. The leaders of 27 EU nations will hold an informal summit in Brussels on June 17th to begin discussions on forming the leadership based on the election results. The candidate for the European Commission will be confirmed at the end of the month. With the European People's Party winning a majority in the election, its leading candidate and current European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen may continue in the role. Lee seung Arirang News. Gaza's health ministry says the death toll from Israel's hostage rescue operation in Gaza on Saturday killed at least 274 Palestinians, including women and children. Israeli centrist minister Benny Gantz announces a resignation from Benjamin Netanyahu's war cabinet, citing the prime minister's mismanagement of the war. Yoon Jin reports. On Saturday, the Israeli military rescued four hostages from the Gaza's al nusayrat camp, which, according to the Gaza Health Ministry, killed at least 274 Palestinians, including 57 women and 64 children, while wounding at least another 600. The death toll is the highest reported in a 24-hour period since the outbreak of the war in Gaza. Israel Defense Forces Rear Admiral Daniel Hagari said the latest operation had been planned for weeks, with the unusual daytime raid intended to create a greater element of surprise, despite the greater associated risks. The Israeli military said that a special forces officer was killed during an exchange of fire. 
According to Hamas, three other hostages, including one with U.S. citizenship, were also killed in the raid. Meanwhile, on Sunday, Israeli Minister Benny Gantz announced his resignation from Israel's three-man emergency war cabinet. Last month, Gantz had set a June 8 deadline to Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to come up with a clear post-war strategy, which the Prime Minister had brushed off. And following the rescue operation on Saturday, Gantz delayed his decision by just a day. Unfortunately, Netanyahu prevents us from progressing to the real victory, which is the justification for the painful and ongoing price. That is why we are leaving the wartime cabinet today with a heavy heart, but with a whole heart. While Gantz's departure would not pose an immediate threat to the Israeli government, it may leave Netanyahu more reliant on his far-right coalition, who stand against the latest U.S.-backed ceasefire proposal. This suggests there's no end in sight for the ongoing Gaza war, which has killed over 36,700 Palestinians. Ian Din, Arirang News. The latest track from K-pop superstar BTS Jungkook titled Never Let Go has swept across global iTunes charts. According to his label Big Hit Music, the digital single topped the charts in 96 countries, including the U.S., Italy and Japan, a day after its release on Friday last week. Now, the song is dedicated to the band's fans ahead of the anniversary this Thursday of the debut of BTS. Events such as a fan meeting with another BTS member soon to be discharged from military service, that's Jin, are also lined up for this week. Jungle was listed as a Billboard's top K-pop artist earlier this year. With his album Golden, staying in the U.S. Billboard 200 chart for longer than any other K-pop solo album. The COVID-19 pandemic is over, but it is necessary to prevent the next pandemic by a coronavirus since it's highly transmittable to humans. Domestic researchers have identified four types of coronaviruses along with COVID-19 that infect people utilizing different infection strategies. Tai yoong has a story. The name coronavirus is derived from the Latin corona, meaning crown, because the spikes on the virus surface resemble a crown. Coronaviruses mostly cause diseases in wildlife and livestock. So far, there are seven identified variants that cause infections in humans. The common cold virus that repeats each year is a representative low pathogenic coronavirus. Other variants that have caused pandemic include SARS in 2003, MERS in 2012, and COVID-19 in 2019. What is the difference among infection routes taken by the coronavirus variants? National researchers have analyzed the infection strategies of four coronavirus variants. As a result, they found out for the first time that each virus attacks different parts of bronchial cells. Researchers created a bronchus organoid, similar to four types of bronchial cells in the human lung primarily. Consequently, they observed the cold virus-infected Clara cells, SARS and COVID-19-infected ciliary cells, and MERS-infected goblet cells. In the case of the MERS virus, we were able to find that it unusually infected goblet cells. The reaction of the host organism to prevent reproduction rate by the four coronavirus variants was also different. When the organoid was infected with SARS, the host controlled the energy needed for the reproduction rate of the virus. The host organism regulated the production of mucus when the organoid was infected with MERS. In the case of COVID-19, protection was vitalized through calcium ions transmitting signals from cells. We were able to figure out that a coronavirus can infect different parts of cells. As infectious disease specialists predict another pandemic in the foreseeable future, it is expected that the result of this research will help to develop targeted therapy for each coronavirus variant. Cha yoong Arirang News. Let's take a look at the latest news in the world now. We begin today in India, where Narendra Modi was sworn in for the third time as the country's prime minister on Sunday in a grand ceremony in New Delhi. 
In his speech, as he was sworn in by India's president, Draupadi Murmu, Modi said he will govern with true faith and allegiance to the constitution and that he will, quote, do right to all manner of people without affection or ill will. Modi took the oath on Sunday along with 72 ministers of the new coalition government. While Modi's Bharatiya Janata Party failed to win an outright majority, his leadership of the National Democratic Alliance coalition government allowed Modi to become only the second prime minister to be elected for a third consecutive term. Thousands of guests, including Bollywood stars, attended the ceremony, as did the leaders of seven neighboring countries. As summer approaches, temperatures have been soaring across the southern parts of North America. In Mexico's northern state of Chihuahua, officials say that heat has caused thousands of dead fish to blanket the surface of a lagoon. Thousands of fish at the Bastillos Lagoon in Chihuahua died as water levels became dangerously low after long dry spells with temperatures soaring above 40 degrees Celsius. According to government data, around 90 percent of Mexico is suffering from some form of drought, the highest level seen since 2011. Local authorities at the lagoon covered the dead fish with lime to mitigate public health risks related to the decomposition of the fish. Meanwhile, cities and towns in the U.S. states of Arizona, California and Texas broke several calendar day heat records last week as the high-pressure heat dome spreads north and west into the U.S. Now to the Congo, where the death toll from Friday's attack by men armed with guns and machetes on villages in the North Kivu province has risen to 41. According to an army spokesperson, the attack was carried out by the Allied Democratic Forces, which allegedly also killed at least 16 people last week. The ADF originates from neighboring Uganda, but is now based in eastern Congo. ADF has pledged allegiance to the Islamic State and has been launching frequent attacks in a region riddled by militant groups. Soldiers from the armed forces of the Democratic Republic of Congo went on a foot patrol on Sunday to urge villagers to remain at home and not flee despite the attack. The iconic landmark of Brazil's Rio de Janeiro, the Statue of Christ the Redeemer, is clad in traditional Korean hanbok clothing. The hanbok was being projected onto the statue in what was the first time it has ever been dressed in the traditional clothing of another country. The event was to celebrate the opening of the Lights of Korea exhibition, which began at Rio's Museum of Contemporary Art from Sunday and the G20 summit set to take place in Brazil in November. The Christ the Redeemer Sanctuary stated that the projected hanbok, chosen by the South Korean designer Jin Hee Lee, represents a union between Korea and Brazil, while the garment's belt featured the colors of the G20 logo. Kim Xiong, Arirang News. Good afternoon. We need to brace for a summer heat wave today. Temperatures should go up 4 to 5 degrees higher than season norms, with a high of 33 degrees Celsius in Daegu, and sunshine is in the forecast for most parts of Korea. But today is only the beginning. We are looking at midsummer heat this week, with temperatures that could nudge toward mid 30s in Daegu and nearby areas, topping out at 35 degrees Celsius by Thursday. And the sun will shine down throughout the week, while the humidity will also gradually go up from now on. Meanwhile, Gyeongsangdo provinces could see 5 to 40 millimeters of passing rain, and south of Gangwon-do could receive 5 to 30 millimeters of showers today. Daily highs could go up 1 to 7 degrees higher this afternoon in most places, topping out at 31 degrees in Gwangju, Gyeongju at 34 degrees. A strong UV rays is in the forecast for many places, so please stay hydrated and safe. With that in mind, let's take a look at the international weather conditions.
That's all we have at this hour. Arirang News will be back at 2 p.m. Korea time. Thanks for watching.